So yeah. here we have all this information just from the Jews that Philo of Alexandria is saying all that's true that is said about him, mm -hmm. but because Plato and Aristotle grill, he said, <laughs> that's just an idea, man. That's just a cool idea. And that's what he was led to believe, that it was just a cool idea, philosophically. Truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Yeah, I'm going to play a little bit further, and I think uh, okay. what I want to do after this is we'll we'll probably go to uh, like Deuteronomy six four, um, and maybe a little bit in Isaiah, just to sure. kind of give. Yeah, let's let's do a, a little response of okay. Here's the foundation. Here's where we're coming from as far as there being one God, and then how He reveals Himself in the not only the Old Testament but the New Testament, just so people will have something to bite their teeth into. Um, yeah, so I I'll have something little... kind of fun planned. I thought that might be fun. Yeah. Um, so I we'll we'll do that. But play this clip, and then I I have something kind of cool planned. All right. Cool. Hopefully, <laughs> it'll be cool. I guarantee it. <laughs> how long have you been in the truth? Or, when did you learn the truth? What they really mean to ask is how long that person has been a member of the organization of Jehovah's Witnesses. They confuse loyalty to the organization with a love of truth. But put their love to the test, and in my fairly extensive experience, the truth loses. Speak the truth to them and you get slander, insults, and shunning in return. In short, persecution. Persecuting those who speak the truth is hardly unique to Jehovah's Witnesses. In fact, Persecuting anyone because they disagree with your belief is a big red flag, isn't it? I mean, if you have the truth, if you're in the right, doesn't that speak for itself? No need to attack the person who disagrees. No need to burn them at the stake. Now, there are very... Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> burn him at the stake. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. I'm not sure if his position is still that Jesus died on a stake or a cross. That's, again, a whole other video. Right. Um, but yeah, it's it's. Uh, I agree with Eric that we should not attack someone because mm -hmm. you know Eric believes different than you and I do, and right. Laura and and many Christians that are Trinitarians. Right. But it's never the intent to attack. I'm going to stand firm, mm -hmm. and I'm going to say what what the Bible says and what what history actually shows. I'm I'm going to stand on it. Mm -hmm. But, you know, there is something to be said, and Eric, you are so right, man, that you don't have to be a jerk to tell someone what the truth is. Correct. Yeah. So I think we have found a huge agreement with Eric mm -hmm. uh, that we don't want to be rude to someone just because we have a different belief. Right. right? Yeah. Yeah. So I guess I well, just wanted to kind of jazz hand in on that one and. Yeah, I agree with Eric on that because I think it's so important that he hears our heart on this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I would I would also say it's um, disagreeing with someone, like pushing back on their on their comments, or or even just again presenting what you believe, because that's what Eric is doing right now. He's presenting what he believes to be true, right? And Absolutely. he he's going to end up coming in opposition with what someone else believes to be true. So him doing that is not unloving or being a jerk or being no. a, a persecutor of other people's faiths. He's just putting forward what he believes to be true. So I I don't really think it's uh, I don't think it's really fair to say, well, that person didn't agree with me 100 percent lockstep. So therefore, I'm being persecuted. Um, I would say, though, that it's unfortunate, but I think unless we're honest about it, <clears throat> people are going to think that we're just trying to, to be nice and get along. There are there are individuals that I've seen comment, that I've made comments, mm -hmm. um, that are Trinitarians. You're a pagan, you're not saved, have fun in hell. Like I've oh. seen some horrible, horrible comments from so-called Trinitarian or Christians. On, on his videos? Not, uh, I don't know about his videos, but I've seen it on a lot of videos. Okay. That, All right. Oh yeah, and this is from Trinitarian Christians. Uh, that not every Trinitarian Christian, but there are some mm -hmm. that claim to have the same beliefs that we do. That instead of just trying to argue the facts, they get mad, have fun in hell, and they say things I think are just unnecessary. 
Well, so I, think I, I would ask that that would not be done. Yes, absolutely. Don't, don't leave mean, rude comments, have fun in hell, or different things like that. Just, you know, share what you believe and talk to people. You can be kind and have a conversation. Mm -hmm. um, I've had to learn that. I've had plenty of conversations where I just lost it, man. And went, you know, I went off on the person. Yeah. And what I've realized is at that point, the conversation isn't going to get anywhere. So if, if, I think if right. we leave mean comments and things like that, it's not going to be helpful. Right. So, yeah, I just wanted to add that in. Yeah, an important side bit on that too is I, I just think um, – I'm not saying if a person leaves a hateful comment, they're not saved or something like that, but it is, no, yeah. you know, Christ does sp speak about, you know, from the outflow of a man's heart, uh, his mouth will speak. So basically yeah. what's inside of him will come outside of him. And I just don't Absolutely. think that the God who came in, in the flesh and sacrificed himself in one of the most horrific deaths possible to rescue people from hell, to give them the possibility of rescue. I don't think he would, would the the comment have fun in hell would ever pass out of his lips because to him hell is justice it's not a fun place and it, and he doesn't take delight in uh sending people or what does it say he doesn't take delight in punishing the wicked yeah it takes no, oh. no delight in the yeah the wicked one being destroyed right there is no delight in god to destroy someone rather He's patient with that person. Mm -hmm. He shows mercy to that person so that they will come to know Christ. And so, yeah, we, we don't always do it perfect. I know I don't. No, uh, me neither. I have to work. Yeah, I have to work on stuff all the time. Uh, the biggest room in my house is the room for improvement. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. So I, I'm constantly, like, working on self. And I know that I've responded in ways before that are just not good. But mm -hmm. what do you do? Do you just hang your hat up or do you lick your wounds, be a man and move forward? Correct. You learn from it and say, wow, that was not helpful. Yeah. I'm going to give you a quick example. I was in California and when I had first got saved, I went to, there was three carts and like seven Jehovah Witness men. And I went ballistic on these guys. Mm -hmm. How dare you hide CSA? And I went off. And they mm -hmm. packed up and left. And as they're leaving, I'm like, that's right. Get out of here, man. <laughs> I mean, I was it was on. I'm in Oceanside, California at Regal Cinemas. And they're out front. And I'm screaming at them, right? Screaming yeah. at them. Get yeah. your back. Get the stuff out of here. And I'm like freaking out. Yep. But I had just found out about the CSA. Yeah. You know what's funny? I left after and I did my, that's right. I got rid of them. My pastor was there. I didn't know this. Oh, he wow. went and asked him. He went over to them and said, hey, can, can I ask you a question? Would you ever want to leave the Jehovah's Witnesses and become like that guy? Yeah. And what they said, I would never leave the Watchtower if I have to act like that. Yep. Mm -hmm. Pastor came and told me that. Oh. Nothing felt worse in the pit of my belly. I never felt so bad. Yeah realizing I was responding in a very emotional, angry response. That's not good, man. Right. And I remember feeling bad about that. And then I remember actively when I go to the carts, I have to slow down. So a lot of times it sounds like, wow, he's speaking very slow. And just, I have to because mm -hmm. my brain starts working over time. I got 5,000 thoughts that come into my head and I want to read regurgitate everything on that person. So mm -hmm. I got to slow myself down. I got to stop and think, even if they say something, I, I, I've had Jehovah Witness men poke me in the chest, push me, do all yeah. kinds of crazy stuff. And I've had to just step back, calm down, think, and now mm -hmm. respond. And yes. so, it just, yeah, it takes time. So I agree with Eric, I guess is the, the this whole like long story short that we, we shouldn't fight with people who disagree with us and be mean, but mm -hmm. we should stand for what's true and stand yeah. on that. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. Do you want to go a little bit further or do you want to, um, or do you want to do that thing that you wanted to try? Let me, I think, you know, 
maybe we should talk about what I wanted to talk about. Because yeah. I think, you know, it's no disrespect to Eric's video. Like, I'm probably going to take the time to watch the whole thing after we're done. Mm -hmm. uh, I I'm, go to work, put my headphones in it, and I'll listen to it. Because mm -hmm. I do believe in being fair. I don't want to misrepresent Eric. And, right. and just broad brush stroke the poor guy, you know. Everything that mm -hmm. guy believes is crazy. No, not at all. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that wouldn't be fair to Eric. So what I will do, though, is I want to talk about how the Trinity or how Jesus being God is not some new thought. It's not something new that Trinitarians came up with at the Council of Nicaea or Constantinople. Mm -hmm. Why? Were they forced to have these beliefs? Okay, so let's talk about for a moment. We're going to have to kind of jump a little bit, but it'll make sense hopefully at the very end. Okay. okay? So let's talk about Philo of Alexandria. A very important uh, one is in the book of Proverbs, where it deals with the subject of wisdom. Now, a lot of scholars will simply say, well, this, these are the characteristics of uh, Yahweh and uh, should not be uh, indicative of a person or hypostasis. But uh, in point of fact, as time went by, and particularly in the area of the New Testament at, at the very beginning, or, and perhaps I should say even before, you get uh, some study of the whole matter of uh, wisdom becoming personified. And this is in... in uh, uh, the book of uh, wisdom and also in the works of uh, the Alexandrian Jew Philo who was a contemporary of Jesus Christ and uh, he dealt with the term logos uh, which would indicate uh, something the same as wisdom in the uh, book of Proverbs and in the book of wisdom now why about this or what about this I should say well the fact of the matter is that uh, the word logos or logos, depending on whether you want to pronounce it as a short or a long O, uh, the uh, Jews or, or the Greeks in the Christ day mix the two of them up all the time. So I guess I'm at liberal to uh, at liberty to do, to do the same thing. Right. And uh, in any case, the term is uh, in our English word log logic, logical, from uh, logos or logos, and uh, it it uh, carried the concept of rationality as well and therefore was very much like wisdom and uh, Philo down in Alexandria of Egypt saw wisdom and uh, Logos as pretty much the same thing and as a personality. But many people have pointed to the fact that uh, wisdom in Proverbs is feminine gender but that didn't bother Philo at all. He said yes and uh, that's the case but it could be understood as a masculine as well or at least as uh, Logos is uh, uh, masculine uh, so wisdom could be uh, uh, indicative of a uh, masculine person or hypostasis. Right. Uh, now, uh, a lot of this is dealt with very clearly in the writings of the famous uh, early Christian uh, scholar, Origen. Okay. Okay. So Philo of Alexandria was a contemporary of Jesus. He came in around, he was born around 20 B.C., and he lived till about 50 AD. So mm -hmm. like he was a contemporary with Jesus, John, Paul. He was the same age. He lived in Alexandria, Egypt. And he has spent a lot of time in Jerusalem where he would understand Ju Judaism, right? Mm -hmm. So he was a real hardcore believer in the sacrifices and all of those things. So he was a Jew. Okay. However, he studied Greek philosophy. And in his studies, you can see when he writes where his ideas come from. So you probably have heard of Plato and Aristotle. Yes. Okay. So literally, Aristotle studied under Plato for about 20 years. At a place, it's called, well, I think it was called the Athens Academy for Philosophical, Scientifical, and Mathematical Sciences in about 380 BCE. 
So all these years before Jesus, all these philosophical ideas are coming around. Philo of Alexandria was studying them. Okay. And what they had to say under philosophy. As you begin to understand Philo of Alexandria, you can see if you just read his stuff, where he got it from. Okay. So Philo of Alexandria believed that we should take the Old Testament pretty much and throw it out as being anything that's legit. So okay, he actually interesting. Took, yeah, Philo took the Pentateuch and said, it's all allegorical, bro. It's just allegorical, man. So, so then he would, go ahead. Oh, okay. So the, the, I always get the Torah and the Pentateuch mixed up. Is the Pentateuch the first, first couple five. of books? Okay. The and then five. the Torah is the books of the law. Yeah. Yeah. The okay. Torah and the Tanakh and the, yeah. So okay. basically Philo took the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch, uh -huh. and said, it's all just to be understood as allegorical. Mm -hmm. All of it. And so, his ideas of, in fact, he would even go so far to say that God is so far removed from us that don't even call him wise. Don't even call him just because that would mean he's like us in some way. He's so mm. far removed from us that don't even call him wise or just. But then he would say, but don't say that he's not wise or unwise or unjust. But <laughs> you kind of see the contradiction playing in. Yeah. So Philo of Alexandria, these ideas would be floating around in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. Now, Philo studied under the Pharisees. This is where it's important. Pharisaical teachings. The Apostle mm -hmm. Paul was a Pharisee, right? Yes. Okay. So this idea of how does all this fit into the Trinity and Jesus, right? Like, what does it have to do with anything? I'm, I'm, I'm kind of about to drive it home. So yeah. Philo of Alexandria, he's teaching all of this Greek philosophy mixed with Judaism. Okay. Saying that everything's just allegorical and, you know, it's, it's these ideas is what makes up who God is. Mm -hmm. Well, there was a teaching that Philo of Alexandria knew about. And it's called the heavenly man. Okay. Mm. So this is where it's really interesting because we see the apostle John and the apostle Paul correcting Philo in the scripture. Before we get to the correction, let's take a look at what were the teachings of this heavenly man. Okay. Do you have your Bible still? Yes. All right. So let's just take a look at Ezekiel chapter 1. As you're Ezekiel, that, 1. Ezekiel 1. And we're going to just look at a couple of verses if you. Um, I'm so using Ezekiel, the, the nearly inspired version. Is that okay? <laughs> totally fine. <laughs> okay. So Ezekiel, when the rabbis would teach the book of Ezekiel, they would expect their students to be kind of at a certain level of understanding. Okay. Because we're now getting into deep understanding of God's word for the mm -hmm. rabbinical Pharisee thought. Okay. Yes. So this is taught by the Pharisees, not Christians. Mm -hmm. This was taught by the Pharisees. Okay. okay. So Ezekiel chapter one and read uh, verse one. Okay. So this is something that Philo should know. Philo does know this. In fact, he, he's teaching this. Okay. So here's right, one Ezekiel, of his teachings. Okay. Ezekiel 1.1. 1, 1. In my 13th year, in the fourth month on the fifth day, while I was among the exiles by the Kibar River, the heavens were opened and I saw visions of God. Okay. So what is Ezekiel about to see? It says he, he saw visions of God. Visions of God. And so uh, in the actual Hebrew, it says that he is about to be shown God in a special way. So okay. it's kind of neat. Okay, so he's about to see God in a very special way. 
the very beginning there is just it's just a time frame. He's by the uh, the Kibar River, and it's probably around 600 BCE. Mm-hmm. So just to kind of give a kind of a little time frame. I, I was going to say I know that this. Um... I know that we're we're talking specific. I don't want people to lose sight of this. We're talking specifically about how Ezekiel is about to see a special revelation, a special vision of God. But the language actually sounds very similar to uh, the first martyr um, when he said, "I." He looked up and he saw Jesus sitting at the the right hand of Stephen of God. Yes, yeah, he, yeah. The heavens opened up and he saw a vision. Um, There's a reason then, why he saw a heavenly man standing mm-hmm. beside. Watch what Philo does. This is so cool. Okay, so Ezekiel, right, is talking about being able to see God in a special way. Uh, Drop down to verse 26. Okay. Ezekiel 1, 26. Because the rest of Ezekiel 1 is just describing the different, like, I saw angels, and then I saw the chariots, and so it's he's looking up into heaven and at the very highest part in heaven above the angels above the chariot above all that stuff he sees someone okay Let's so you who, said 126 yeah 126 i believe okay it's from memory so it's good <laughs> above the vault over their heads was what looked like a throne of lap- lapis lazuli and high above on the throne was a figure like that of a man. Like what? Like that of a man. Oh, a man. So he saw at above the vault. So Jewish uh, understanding is that, and God said, and God said, and so there's these different levels of heaven. And at the very highest, he's seen what looks like a man, a figure oh. of a man. Drop down to verse... 28, it's the very last verse. I think it's 27 or 28. Okay. This was the... uh, Yeah, It's halfway through 28, actually. Um, Like the appearance of a rainbow in the clouds on a rainy day, so was the radiance around him. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. That's all caps, L-O-R-D. When I saw it, I fell face down and heard the voice of one speaking. Okay. So we start Ezekiel 1 1 with Mm -hmm. I'm about to see a special, uh, it's about to be special and unique Mm -hmm. the way that I see God. Now keep in mind, when the Bible says I had a vision, the heavens are opened up, Dorothy, you are not in Kansas anymore. We are right. We are now seeing into heaven. And Mm -hmm. so he's seeing this heavenly man. Mm-hmm. But yet it's the glory of Yahweh. You see? Mm-hmm. So the rabbinical thought, Philo taught that this heavenly man by Ezekiel, by Daniel, and by other prophets that, that talked about this heavenly man and the image. What makes it so cool is this image. Uh, in the Hebrew, it's dilute. And so go back to Genesis 126. Okay, you said Genesis 126. Yeah. Because Ezekiel 126 is talking about the image of a man. And notice Genesis 126. So it's easy to remember. Ezekiel okay. 126, Genesis 126. That's cool. It's almost providential. <laughs> <laughs> it would seem that way, right? Because it says. Thank you. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our Wait. likeness. Yeah, image and likeness. Mm-hmm. I saw someone that looked like a man. Yep. Let us make man in our image. I have mm-hmm. the same likeness of mm-hmm. this man of heaven, and then I also have soul and spirit. Sound familiar? Yeah. Sounds almost Trinitarian. Yeah. But what? <laughs> But watch, it's not done. It's not done. So Philo is teaching this, right? So you could literally go back and read. Go to the Jewish uh, encyclopedia. Mm -hmm. So you can just look it up. The Jewish encyclopedia. And there's a subheading there called Heavenly Man. Okay. And the Jews, not the Christians, the Jews talk about every person that ever brought up 
this heavenly man. Guess who's mentioned there? The Apostle Paul. How did mm. Paul, why are the Jews quoting from the Apostle Paul? Right. Because the Apostle Paul was correcting Philo, and they also bring up Philo of Alexandria with this mm. heavenly man. So Philo, bring it back to his day, is telling people that, yeah, I studied under the Pharisees and Judaism and philosophical thought. So this heavenly man he says, is the Logos. Wait a second. Mm -hmm. He's calling, Philo of Alexandria is calling him the Logos? Why would he say heavenly man is the Logos? Because of the Jewish Targums. Mm -hmm. The Jewish Targums, which just means translation, was for the Hebrew, right? So the uh, Hebrew scriptures would be read twice and then explained in a Targum which okay. was written down. The Targums in Genesis 1-1, I believe it's either uh, Targum Onkelos or Targum Neophyte. But if you just look those up at Genesis 1-1, it says there that in the beginning, the Memra, the Word, the Logos mm. of God created everything. So is Memra I, the Hebrew word? Say again, brother. Is, is Memra the Hebrew word for I know logos? it's Aramaic. Okay, all right. So Memra is the Aramaic word for the Greek the word, word that we would be logos, and then in English it would be the word. Yeah. Okay. So, so Philo the, so okay. Philo says that the heavenly man from Ezekiel from Daniel is the same as the logos being explained. He he's the same. And guess what was taught by the Jews? In the encyclopedia, you can just look it up. This Logos, or the man of heaven, had no beginning. I'm now going to quote Pharisaical teaching. Not Christian. It's going to sound like Colossians in one second here. But it says that this Logos, or this man of heaven, has he was not created. He's a mm. king. He's a king. And he has always existed with God. This is where that idea of the problem of the two Yahwehs by Michael Heisler uh -huh. comes in. They had a struggle. There's only one God, but yep. yet the word is the one that created everything. And he is the king of the world. Mm -hmm. So that is a pharisaical teaching that the Logos or the heavenly man had no beginning he upholds the universe by the word of his power that's the pharisees by the way that's the pharisees that's that... <laughs> and that he created all things that's the pharisees by the way that's not just the book of colossians or wow. the apostle john so yeah. here we have all this information just from the jews that philo of alexandria is saying all that's true that is said about him, mm -hmm. but because Plato and Aristotle grew, he <laughs> said, that's just an idea, man. That's just a cool idea. And that's <laughs> what he was led to believe, that it was just a cool idea philosophically. Okay. So what, is, so what does the Apostle Paul do with that? Because this teaching is going around. Paul knew about it. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Okay. And let's see what Paul does, and then we'll see what John does with this. And I'll bring it together and tell you why it's so important. So you said 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15, start in 45, and I think we'll just go to 49, if my memory serves me right. Okay. So, so it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam, a life-giving spirit. The spiritual did not come first, but the natural, and after that the spiritual. The first man was of the dust of the earth. The second man is of heaven. Wait. As was... Go ahead. Read that part one more time. The first man was from where? The first man was of the dust of the earth. The second man is of heaven. Oh, he's from heaven then. Oh, okay. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> gotcha. 
As was the earthly man, so are those who are of the earth. And as is the heavenly man, so also are those who are of heaven. And just as we have borne the image of the earthly man, so shall we bear the image of the heavenly man. Yeah, the heavenly man. He's mm -hmm. correcting Philo of Alexandria, who mm -hmm. says that this heavenly man that Ezekiel saw, who has always existed, he's always existed. He's the logos of God, mm -hmm. he's the memra, right? He's saying, no, I'm sorry, Philo, yeah, it's not just a cool idea. That guy that Ezekiel saw, who mm -hmm. always existed, yeah, he became flesh mm. and became Jesus. He was a king. If you look at the Jewish dictionary, they picture the Logos as a king. Yeah. On his right arm, it's mercy. On his left arm, it's justice. And it's a picture of a king. And they don't yeah. even realize it's so beautiful because on the king's head in a Jewish dictionary, it shows a crown. And guess what's at his feet? The kingdom. Mm. This is Jewish teaching, not Christian. So yeah. when Paul sees this, he corrects him and says, no, no, the, the heavenly man is who we're in the image of. And that's why Paul says at the end, just as we have the image of the man of the dust, mm -hmm. like we have the image of Adam, we are also going to have the image of the man in heaven. Mm. And see that's how that cool. plays out? Jesus, the whole point of 1 Corinthians 15 is about the resurrected body. Yep. And so Jesus has his body, and we are going to have a resurrected body. Not that we're going to be God, but Correct. we're going to have a resurrected body like his. Yes. Like Job said, I will see my maker face to face. Mm -hmm. So we, we see the correction, John 1, 1, in the beginning, and that's why it's in my opinion, it's irresponsible to, I mean, Bruce Metzger is, is probably one of the greatest like scholars and, and there's many, many others, but these guys would not translate John 1, 1 as a God. Right. Cause you're missing the point. If you do that, if you say that Jesus is a God, then you're agreeing with Philo of Alexandria or, or men like that. These are the apostles speaking against it. Yes. Saying that, no, in the beginning was the word, the logos or the memra. Mm -hmm. He used it for that reason, because the teaching in the Targums was that the memra created all things. It was mm -hmm. through him and for him. That's mm -hmm. Jewish teaching. Right. So what John does is he says, no, you're right. That man in heaven from Ezekiel is Jesus who became flesh. He's the mm. eternal God. He's had no beginning. Yeah. So the argument from all of this is that Philo of Alexandria is mixing this Greek philosophical gnarly idea uh -huh. and he's mixing it with Judaism and saying it was just an idea. Yeah. That's a cool thought. And it's easy, like you said, it's easy to remember because it's Ezekiel 126, Genesis 126. And now you go into 1 Corinthians near the end. And you can see the correction. So I'm sorry, continue. Yeah, John 1.1. 1, 1. And so here are the Jews all this time for all these years envisioning, and this is the Pharisees. Mm -hmm. We can see why Paul Paul could answer them so swiftly and so artfully. Like, I love yep. Paul. Uh -huh. He's just like, I just love you, man. Like, it's just so cool. <laughs> right? Yeah, the way he answers is like, yeah, sorry, Philo. I appreciate what you're saying. Like, it's great that you have these philosophical ideas and all this stuff. But when you have to throw away the Old Testament, yes. like Mar Marcion threw out the Old Testament, kept 10 letters of Paul and only part of Luke. Uh, when, when, you, when you have to do that to make your philosophical ideas work, you, you're wrong. Right. Because it's Bible then philosophy. You can't uh -huh. take your philosophical ideas and it just, it, it's just my opinion. I don't think it's a good idea to take your philosophical ideas and hold them above scripture. Mm -hmm. That's not how it should be done. And that's why right. Paul and John were correcting Philo and also the Gnostics and the other teachings. Yes. So it becomes a very important issue 
uh, that Paul and John were, were disputing against. Mm -hmm. And what's really cool is that the Jews thought that this king is in heaven. The Memra is a king, mm -hmm. right? Uh, when Jesus was born, right, and the Magi came, who were they seeking to worship? Uh, was it gonna be? Was it gonna be the king? Yeah, Magi oh, were cool. like, they're like, where's baby Jesus, the king? Yeah, where did, where did this king come from? He came from heaven. He's the yeah. he's the heavenly man. He's the Memra, the Lagos, the Word, the Eternal One, the Anarche in Halagos. I mean, he is the eternal God of the Bible. He's not the Father. Mm -hmm. He comes out of the Father. It's he is. That's why Jesus would say, "I and the Father are one," mm -hmm. because they are one. And just yes. you wanted to talk about Deuteronomy, and this is a good place to do it. Um, the Shema. Shema mm -hmm. Israel, Yahweh Eloheinu, Yahweh Echad, right? That's the famous... So this is a Hebrew. Jewish daily prayer. Oh, yeah. Uh, Jesus would have said it. In fact, he even quoted it when the rich man came to him. What's the mm -hmm. greatest commandment? He's like, Shema! He's like, Shema the guy. Um, yeah, yeah so... Guy. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. It's my I love it. So he says, you know, Shema Israel, Hero Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, right? Mm -hmm. The word one that, that's used, Echad, is not the word for numeral one. Correct. It's not. Look up Echad in the Hebrew. It does not mean numeral one. It's the same word used when Jesus said, it's a Greek, now we're talking, it's quoted in the Greek, but uh -huh. Jesus said, a woman and a man will get married and they will become one flesh. Mm -hmm. That's like I said to you, have you and Chelsea become one physical flesh? Yep. Oh, no, well, no we physically haven't become one flesh, but. If you do, please send me pictures because that would be gnarly, man. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll look like some sort of Greek, like myth, yeah. mythological creature. <laughs> now Philo's interested, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so it's not that you become one flesh. You're like inside of it. You know, it's it's that you're, you're one in your thoughts and in unity and, and, and all the ways that we understand that to be. Mm -hmm. That's the understanding of the Shema. It's not that echad means one, one, the numeral one. Right. It's literally that this this one is shared by three co-eternal persons, yes. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. You know, just saying God is love. And this is just conjecture now, okay? So not the Lord say, but I say, right? <laughs> uh -huh. um, like when we say God is love, and he's always been love. Mm -hmm. That to me describes in such majestic, beautiful language, the nature of God. You have the lover, who's the mm -hmm. father, the beloved, who's the son. And you have the spirit that is there to share that relationship with father and son. It's love. Yep. That God. And so to tear it all down, I think you would have to. And I could, I think I see now, now that we're talking about this, I see why Eric is a henotheist. Because there's no way that you could hold to monotheism and believe that Jesus is God. Or, you know, you have to switch it. So for me, I'm a monotheist. Mm -hmm. But if saying Jesus is God, well, I would have to switch then. No. And so that's what the Bible does, is it is it very carefully. In fact, John 1.1, 1, 1, uh, it could be it's turned on his head. Yeah, it really is. And he was extremely careful to make sure in the beginning was the Lagos, the Memra. Mm -hmm. Everybody there knew what he was talking about from, from, uh, from the Targum. Mm -hmm. And then he says, um, and the word was with God, prostanfaon. So like you, you could feel your breath when you talk on your hand, mm -hmm. it was that kind of relationship. 
and okay. yet the word was God. So it, it doesn't say that he's the father there. It says that he's God. It's by nature. Yes. Yeah. And, you know, the versions that I have found, um, let me just kind of explain something that I think will help also. The versions that I have found that support Jesus is a God. Uh, first off, Johannes Grieber and mm -hmm. his wife, which, hey, I'm not saying that uh, Eric's involved with Johannes Grieber or his wife or believe any of that stuff. I don't know. Right. But I think everyone knows that that was a, an occultist Bible. It's just, it was what it was. <laughs> right. But the Watchtower, yeah, right. But the Watchtower also does this little thing where they will say, uh, we're quoting from Archbishop Newcomb's translation. Mm -hmm. This is the biggest scam, one of the biggest scams I've seen on their website about the Trinity uh, and, and saying that, hey, other people have translated it as a god. Here's how it's a total sham. Mm -hmm. If you look at Archbishop Newcomb's translation of John 1.1, 1, 1, mm -hmm. it reads, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. But wait a second. The Watchtower, what they're doing is they're using Thomas Belsham. That's why it's a sham or a scam, <laughs> oh, right? <laughs> so Thomas Belsham with the new improved version Mm -hmm. who wrote in the forward that this is for the Unitarian, it, it was a bias. Oh. It was wrote with a Unitarian bias. He admits mm. it. Okay. So he's not, they're not quoting from Archbishop Newcomb. They're quoting from Thomas Belsham, Belscam, mm -hmm. his doctored up new improved version. Okay. And they just, they keep his name because Archbishop Newcomb was respected. Yep. So many people think, I'm reading Archbishop Newcomb, he says that Jesus is, is a God. No. Go back to the forward and read read the beginning of the book. Yeah. And you'll see it's Thomas Bel Belsham. Belsham. Mm. It's his <laughs> version, which he admits is a bias for Unitarianism. Yes. Which comes way later. That wasn't uh -huh. like something like Irenaeus, Polycarp, or Clement of Rome wrote. Mm -hmm. These are men that have a bias and have translated from a translation. Yes. Wrong, John 1.1. 1, 1, and then to say, fit oh, bias. yeah, check out Archbishop Newcomb. It's not Archbishop Newcomb. It's Thomas Belsham. Oh, man, the amount of like to does make that. the deception happen. <laughs> like, it's, it's like... Uh, it's almost on par with like what they do in Colossians uh, one, you know what I mean? When they're, when they're yes. adding the word other in there consistently. Um, you, see, so. and, you know, if we have time, I, I don't know how long that we've been going, but we're at uh, an hour 35 now. Okay. So maybe I could just bring this up um, and we could maybe kind of call it here and maybe we could just hope Eric sees this. We'll pray for our brother that he'll make a video. And maybe we could just have something to interact with if he wants to, and it, yeah. as we have to. Yeah. So Colossians, where uh, the Watchtower puts all other things. First off, the words just aren't there in Greek. Adoros mm -hmm. and hetero. It's just not there, okay? We all know that part. But here's the part that's really cool. Irenaeus, church father, sorry. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's, it's just a quick point about Irenaeus. Irenaeus was just accepted by the Catholic Church as a doctora of the church. And oh, like every priest, every priest that was there said the same thing. They were like, wasn't he already a doctora of the church? <laughs> <laughs> right. Like, like why there's are we doing this now? Huge in that Irenaeus, right? So for those who don't know, Irenaeus wrote a five volume set. It's called Adverses, Heresies in Greek, uh, which means against heresies. And he wrote this whole volume set to dispute amongst the Gnostics of his day. He did so in and around 180, 185. Irenaeus started in Smyrna with Polycarp. So he was a Western church guy, mm -hmm. right? And then he moved to Lyons, France, right? 
So now is an Eastern God, which is why I say Irenaeus teaches us to breathe out of both lungs, the mm -hmm. Western and the Eastern church, because he is the embodiment of someone who did both. Mm -hmm. In his books, he writes the most amazing stuff. So for Colossians, a great way to just shut down a Jehovah Witness on their idea of Colossians and that Michael the Archangel had something to do in creation, Irenaeus is a good place to go. If you have the set, you could just look it up online uh, Against Heresies, Book 3, Chapter 11, and the very first paragraph. As you start to read that paragraph, your mind will be so blown because it'll sound like a, a very modern, systematic the theological book. In mm -hmm. fact, he's our earliest of the fathers that gave us such a awesome systematic theology book. He's the okay. first. And he's the man. No, <laughs> and he's so, the man. And he's the man. So five volume set, book three, chapter 11, page one. He quotes John 1.1. 1, 1. He quotes it. Okay. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God, not a God. And then he uses this, John 1.1, 1, 1, to explain how Jesus is God. He was never created. Mm -hmm. This is Irenaeus, yeah. who was taught by Polycarp, who was praised by Jesus in the book of Revelation. That's important to remember about this guy. So he writes that Jesus is not created. He's always been, and he uses John 1.1. 1, 1. Then, guess what he talks about? How the angels could have had no part in creation. Sorry, Michael. That <laughs> right. all of the created beings, no matter who they are or what they are, angels or anything, had zero part in creation. It was God alone through Christ, the Memra, the Lagos, the Word, who created all things, mm -hmm. not all other things. Irenaeus shut down the watchtower in 185, and he had no idea. Right. It's beautiful, man, and that's why it's so important. I'm not saying you have to read Irenaeus and understand, have to believe everything he taught, because he taught a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, and, and so I, but what I'm saying is, though, is what, when we look at the earliest people, Polycarp Clement, Ignatius and Irenaeus, the earliest ones. What did they teach? Because they were taught by the apostles. They were right. praised by Jesus for doing a good job. Mm -hmm. I think I would maybe take that serious. Right. You know? Yeah, if, if you're, if for whatever reason you're not going to trust what's actually said in the New Testament letters, then you can, you can at least look at the letters that are written right after um, the guys who studied with the guys who walked with Christ. So... Yeah. And even you know, at the same time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we do. We have the Gospels. We have the New Testament letters that, I mean, we could go through all of the apologetic verses that I believe Eric has heard before. Um, and then for, yeah. for whatever reason, he just doesn't find them compelling. So, you know, when you, I, I just think, um, again, it, it wasn't accepting... I wasn't accepting something because I thought it would be fun to just, you know, accept this new faux fangled <laughs> thing or whatever. But when I read that the father raised Jesus from the dead, and when I read yeah. that the the son says um, that if you tear down this temple in three days, I will raise it up. So we have the son claiming that he's going to raise his own body from the dead. And then you have, um, you know, it later in scripture where it says put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the spirit. So we have the Father claiming to raise Jesus. We have Jesus claiming to raise Jesus, and the Spirit taking raising Jesus. So who who done it, David? Who raised God. Jesus from the dead? The yeah. easy answer is God. Yeah, you know. So that yeah. if we don't have the triune nature of God, then we have a contradiction here. The Son is saying something out of turn from the Father, and the Spirit's yeah. taking credit away from both of them, which is wrong. We have a contradiction here, unless God raised Jesus from the dead. Yeah, and you know there is there is no contradiction. If if you if you take away that Jesus is God and He's a little God, well, you would have to because it's you know, and that's why for me, I'm trying to get people like Eric and and other people. I want to get you away from cherry picking, mm -hmm. and I don't want to be asked 
what is your best verse to prove the Trinity? Give me your right. best. I think, really? That would be like, you know, if, if I was to ask you, Brandon, about Chelsea, tell me about her whole life in one sentence. Give me your best. Right. Mm-hmm. Really wouldn't be able to be effective. Right. And I think the whole story of starting in Genesis that we're made in God's image. And then we see this heavenly man and the Jews describing him, well, Ezekiel describing him as this picture of a man. It's like a man, but yet it's the glory of Yahweh. It's the Mm -hmm. glory of God. And then we see in the Targums in the days of Daniel and and so forth, uh, uh, Ezra. And we would see in the Targums that this Memra or the word is this king and all things were created through him and for him. This is before Jesus. Yep. Then we get to Jesus and we see the incarnation. This king that the Jews kept talking about in pharisaical circles. Mm-hmm. He became flesh and the Magi said, where's the king? Mm-hmm. They didn't like that very much. So this king that was born to be king would die for our sins and he would rise on the third day and now he's ascended and seated at the right hand of the father and this heavenly man that was just spirit has now become flesh and he mm-hmm. shares the same flesh as his as hebrews 2 would say that jesus is not ashamed to call us brothers and sisters for he took on the same things that we did Yep. And then Paul would drive it home and say, yep, that man of heaven became flesh, died for your sins, rose, and he's seated at the right hand of God. That's why Stephen said that. I mm-hmm. see you seated at the right hand of God because mm-hmm. he's seeing Jesus, the physical man. And even Jesus said, he's like, hey, come and touch me. A spirit hath not flesh and bone the way you see me have it, right? Yep. They're like, exactly. how is that? Wait a second. How's that possible? Mm-hmm. So, and that's why the other scriptures in Jesus uh, is pleased that the fullness of the deity dwells in him bodily. It's just so much there that yeah. I want people to see the whole story, not just one little verse that might prove it. The Father and I are one. Gotcha. Like, that's not very yeah. helpful, right? Yeah, John right. 10 30 dropping. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. It's the whole yeah. story. It's the whole council of scripture yeah. and they all, they all complement each other. They, like you said, um, there there's like one is, one is explaining the next it's, it's, I don't know. It's beautiful. Once you get a, once you get a handle of it and it's such a, yeah. it's such a really cool thing. And again, it explains so many instances in the old Testament. I mean, we'd have another huge contradiction. No one can see God at any time and live, but yeah. you have Abraham, making a, a cheeseburger for Yahweh himself, you know, and he's walking with Yahweh and, you know, you have Yahweh, huh? I want a cheeseburger. <laughs> <laughs> well, right. It's the fattened calf and like cur- curdled yeah. milk. So, um, but we have all these instances where Jacob, he wrestles yeah. with God, Wrestle you know, how, Lord, how yeah. is this possible? We, we have the angel of the Lord, you know, uh, in front of Samson's parents, you know, the, the husband even drops down and says, we're going to die. We just saw God. So we have so many instances where this would be a That's what Ezekiel did. It, it's funny in that, in that account. It says like Ezekiel realized, he's like, I'm about to see God. He's like, I'm going I'm to have a vision of God. And, and then he sees him uh-huh. and it says he falls on his face. <laughs> right. <laughs> he right. just like falls on his face because the glory of the Lord is so rich. Isaiah, he's like, I'm a man of unclean lips. Yes. You know, so we just see I'm this undone. constant reminder of how holy 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 god is Mm -hmm. we have a holy father we have a holy son and we have a holy spirit and god is holy and in the presence of this holy righteous god we will fall to our faces and that's Mm -hmm. every knee shall bow to the glory of jesus christ yes so i believe that the full story of the bible the women after the resurrection running to Jesus, grabbing his feet, and doing what? They prostituted him. him. They worshiped him. Right. Mm-hmm. So we got so many accounts. The kings or the magi wanted to come worship the king. Mm-hmm. We have uh, Thomas. And uh, again, it's just a lot of cherry picking. But if you read the whole story, 
oh, wow, it makes total sense. Yep. Yeah. yeah. I think cherry picking is, is hindering people. Correct. Yeah. If if you need just one verse to prove it, that's it. It makes no sense. Uh, again, you have to it. you have to have multiple lines of evidence to establish a claim. Even when Jesus, exactly. he's talking about two unique persons. When he's saying, "I'm not just testifying about myself, but my Father is also testifying about me." So there exactly. was there was the two witnesses needed. Yes. Um. So. Yeah, we. I don't know. We uh, we could go on and on, man. But I, I think it's probably, it's probably good to wrap up there. And yeah, uh, I don't know. We'll we'll figure out if we want to make this like this whole video like a two parter. And I'll also, what's what's so funny is without having watched much of the video, David, I'm telling you, when when you go to watch this video on your own, you're gonna be like, wow, we talked about that. Wow, we talked about that. You even, yeah. you even talking about Philo and all and and. Uh, I don't know. You're you're gonna get a kick out of it when you listen to it. But I just feel like the spirit led this, um, and he allowed us to handle different points in the video. Because I'm telling you, I listened to that video yeah. like five times to make sure we were prepared. And um, we we talked we about a lot. Barely, of but any of it. <laughs> I'm sorry, brother. <laughs> <laughs> no, we we really did handle a lot in there. You know, we yeah. tackled the henotheism, the fact yeah. that the the Jews, you know, thought there was a bunch of other little gods, but they just believed in the Almighty. Yeah. Um. And then Isaiah comes and demolishes that idea. He's like, I'm going to, I'm going to make it plain to you that there's no God. God's saying there's, I, I don't even know of any other gods, right? Yeah, so exactly. let's just get rid of that, that teaching, you know, Paul seconds that there's so many other verses that talk about that. So we dealt with the henotheism. We dealt yeah. with some historical guys who were big proponents of Jesus Christ being God. You know, they, they weren't walking around trying to prove the spirit or anything like that. They were just fighting the heresies of their day, and that was Clement, Jesus is God. Clement, Clement is in the Book of Life. Yes. Yeah, it I'm was really cool. When, when you... he's an approved resource. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Just saying. And that's the other thing is I, I think you've given people some good sources. Um, again, if you need something outside of Scripture, you can go and look at these guys and what they were writing. And if, yeah, if you out. don't want to— if you don't want to believe me or David or, or Eric, and I don't think you should, you know, you should be like a Brian, you should receive things happily and then go and see if these things are so. And Amen. I think that would just be the message is like, Test you know, all things. yeah, yeah. It's, it is biblical to be skeptical. Um, and just to make sure that what you believe is true. And I think that that is worship that our, our father would approve of for sure. Amen. Man. Amen. All you right. have any, well, I... any, uh, other two cents that you want to add in here, David? Uh, just that, you know, overall, if anybody's watching this and you've made it this far, uh, it's a lot of information. It's a lot of facts and history. Uh, the long and short of all of this is I, I want you to know Christ. Yes. I want you to, I want you to know him. Mm -hmm. Not, not just read about him. I've read Clement Polycarp. All that is just this, right? The Bible says, Knowledge puffs up, mm. love builds up. And mm. I really love everybody who's watching right now. I may not know you personally, I may know you personally, but I want you to know Christ. Because when you come to know Christ, you don't just get eternal life. You don't just have forgiveness of sins. All those things are necessary and part of the gospel for me the biggest thing that I have found, and I will quote this forever, I have peace with God. Yeah. That was the biggest problem I had. I, I couldn't seem to get right. I had this weight on my shoulders, wanted to know God. I just, I had a problem. And I mm -hmm. had peace with God because of Jesus. Yes. And that's what I want. I want that for everybody, man. I want mm -hmm. that for everybody. Yeah. So I think I would just throw that in at the end that, you know, we care about you and we care what you believe. Mm -hmm. And the gospel is a simple message, but it's also deep and majestic and beautiful. Yes. And so it's both, it's both. It, it doesn't just have to be one or the other. The Trinity wasn't some made up pagan doctrine to confuse people. It was literally, we're monotheists and Jesus is taking the name of Yahweh and applying it to himself. What do we do with this? Right. That takes time. It takes study and it takes an honest approach to what was said 
and how do we understand this? It's, it just takes honesty. And praise God, they were they took their time with it. It wasn't yeah. something hasty. Absolutely. So, you know, is Jesus God in my in my studies and my research? One hundred percent. Yes. Jesus yes. is the eternal God of the Bible. He is not the father and he is not the Holy Spirit, but he is the eternal God who became flesh, died for your sins, rose on the third day so that you could have eternal life and peace with God. Amen. A little message that. at the end there. A little plug <laughs> for the gospel, baby. <laughs> yep. Yep. Yeah. You got to You got to end it with that. So I, I yeah. again, along with David, just want to thank you guys so much for uh, nerding out with us because we could talk about this stuff for another two hours uh, easily. Yeah, absolutely. So There's so much if, more. If your attention span was this long, we really appreciate you guys. We hope you have a wonderful day and God bless. Thank you. Truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God.